Stop to think for a second about how to tell you're doing well financially. Not someone else, you personally. What does that measurement look like? Maybe that you have an emergency fund, no bad debt, max out your Roth IRA or 401k, you make more money than your wife's sister's boyfriend, or possibly that you're not living paycheck to paycheck. But I think that there's a better way to determine how you're doing financially. In fact, after working with many people on their personal finances over the past few years, I've uncovered better ways to gauge the health of your finances that are not so obvious, and I wanna share them with you. While all of these are a way to tell how you're doing financially, I think that it misses one big thing. We're all at different points on this long journey of doing smart things with our money. It's easy to assume that doing well financially is an all or nothing game. That to be successful, you have to fully unlock each of these achievements or else you are a complete loser, failure, scum of the earth. But it's not. And I'd argue that setting these sorts of financial destination expectations while we're on the path towards some level of financial independence will leave you feeling like you are always coming up short or falling behind. After noticing this, what I'll call end goal problem in the people that I've worked with with, I've had to come up with different ways to help them measure where they're actually at financially. Take for instance, someone who is focused on a specific outcome. So let's use increasing your income as an example. If Joe makes $60,000 right now, but wants it to be $100,000, then how is he doing financially in the context of making more money? Well, if Joe isn't putting in effort, then I'd say he's doing a pretty poor job. Now, on the other hand, if he's actively working through a plan to increase his income, then I think he is doing well financially. No, Joe hasn't hit that final goal of $100,000, which might actually take a few years to achieve. But every day he puts in the work towards making that number a reality, which is a win. In the book Atomic Habits, James Clear calls this sort of thing casting a vote. He says that every action you take is a vote for the type of person you wish to become. Therefore, achieving some financial goal is less about the outcome and more about the identity that you cultivate along the way through daily practice. So Joe might be working through this income plan using an up, out, in framework for increasing his income. Every week, he's focused on a plan within his current employment to move up in the company. Or he's focused on a plan to increase his income by finding new opportunities outside of his current employment. Or maybe he's working through a plan to develop an internal skill to increase his monetary value to the outside world in general. If you haven't fully checked off the box for what you want to achieve financially, but you're actively working through a plan to get there, then yes, you are doing well financially. So keep going and don't stop. But the plan you're actively working through has a lot to do with understanding the game you actually want to play. I see this trip up so many people, and honestly, that includes myself as well. We're all bombarded with what everyone else in the world is doing financially. Some of them we know personally, and others are randos on the internet who we'll never meet. This person just got a new car. That family just bought a house that's twice as big as their last one. This dude is bragging on the internet about how he made $2 million by the age of 30. Somehow, what we see these outsiders doing starts to influence what we're doing, and we end up playing their financial game and not ours. But do you actually know what game those individuals are playing outside of what's visually obvious? And are you sure that their game is the one that you want to be playing? Because if you don't have the answers to those questions, then it would be like going into a football game game and trying to play it using the rules of a basketball game. It doesn't make any sense. I'd even bet that most other people have no idea what they want. They're just operating based on impulse and what they see everyone else doing. So you trying to copy them is like a real life version of the human centipede. You just end up with a stomach full of someone else's recycled garbage. I'm by no means implying that the financial life everyone else is pursuing should be considered bad or wrong. In fact, I encourage you to use it as a guide to help you figure out what you do and don't want. People who are doing well financially have clearly defined their game and they measure themselves based on those rules. Okay, so you could afford a $30,000 car like this guy, but cars are not that important to you, so you choose to spend $20,000 instead. You could afford to buy a home like that nice family over there, but you value your time, so you decide to rent instead because owning a home comes with a lot more baggage than most like to admit. If you don't choose the financial game that you want to play, then the world will choose it for you. Next thing you know, you'll be sitting there feeling unfulfilled because you're living someone else's dream life 
and not yours. But to know what game you want to play, you need to have a good understanding of what is enough for you. In Jack Bogle's book Enough, he tells a story about a conversation between two writer friends at a party put on by a hedge fund billionaire. As they both sat there on the outskirts of the party to take a break, Kurt leaned in to inform Heller about how this billionaire made more money in a single day than Heller had earned from his very popular book, Catch-22, over its existence. This caught Heller a little by surprise, and he responded by saying, yes, but I have something he will never have, enough. Now, I've never actually read Catch-22 before, but it's become an American classic, and by the 25th anniversary, has gone on to sell more than 10 million copies in the United States. That sounds pretty darn successful to me. The word enough is a funny one, because on the surface, it implies that you've settled. There's no reason to try to achieve more, because you have what you need. But if Heller truly believed that he had enough, then why did he go on to write five more books? Because pursuing more is perfectly fine, as long as you don't become a slave to it in the process. Having enough represents the balance between desire and satisfaction. It's not an exact science though, and mileage may vary depending on the person. Think of it like the thermostat in your house. Everyone's set point will be different based on many different factors, so there's always going to be wiggle room in the numbers. But what we know for sure is that there is such a thing as too much. If you can figure out what is enough for yourself, then you're doing well financially. Defining what is enough is downstream of one key driver for everything we've talked about up until this point. And I think that it might be the most important one out of them all. Imagine we have two people. Ethan is investing a little bit for his future, but he's taking a more passive, kick the can down the road approach to his money situation. He has debt and pays minimum payments on time, but largely tries to avoid looking at the balances since all of this money stuff kind of makes him feel anxious and overwhelmed. Plus, with all of the negative content that he consumes, he's convinced that his future is pretty much screwed. The price of everything is constantly going up. Social security is running out. He assumes that he'll probably die sick and broke because the healthcare system in the US isn't getting any better, and he has lost faith in the people running the country. There's no point in trying to progress. On the other hand, we have Michael, who is in the same financial situation as Ethan, but he does things a little differently with his money. Michael is constantly working towards increasing the amount that he's investing and started to pick up some side work to get those bad debts paid off sooner. While he acknowledges the potential shortcomings of the same things Ethan worries about in the future, he decides to approach his finances with a more proactive mindset. The thing that separates Ethan, who isn't doing well financially, and Michael, who is doing well financially is agency. You see, Michael knows that he hasn't reached his full potential yet, but he has made a conscious choice to take full control of how his future is going to play out. He's decided to take responsibility for his actions and inactions. While Michael knows that there are many outside influences working against him, this isn't anything new. History is full of endless examples showing why the future didn't look that bright. But here we are. It's never been easier to connect and interact with anyone across the world. Food is readily available and can be acquired extremely quickly. Transportation is easily accessible, and everyone has the ability to make money using the phone in their pocket. It's not perfect, but no one said it would be, and it sure as hell is better than living at any point in the past. Trust me, I've never met someone who had agency who decided to shape their own future and didn't improve their financial life in one way or another. So if you're someone who lives your life with agency and you really believe that you do in fact have an impact on the way your future plays out, then you, my friend, are doing well financially. But to actually get to a point where you have agency with your financial future, you need to understand this one thing, and that is your personal psychology. It drives all of your decisions, no matter how big or small your account balances are. We're all generally the same, but what makes each of us unique is how we think, behave, and react to different situations. It's why someone can have millions of dollars in the bank and still feel insecure about their finances. It determines the habits that we have around spending and saving money. And it's why some people decide to take more risks with their money while others don't. Beliefs about money are ingrained in us from childhood experiences and play out as we get older. The good news is that they can be changed if they're negatively impacting our behavior. Recognizing and understanding these deep-seated beliefs about money is the first step towards doing well financially. It involves uncovering the narratives that we've been telling ourselves about wealth, success, and security. Are you holding on to a scarcity mindset afraid that there will never be enough? 
Or are you trapped in a cycle of addictive spending, attempting to fill some emotional void with material possessions? Identifying these patterns is very important, but it's not just about uncovering these unhealthy beliefs about money. We also have to actively overcome them. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. This might mean challenging those long-held beliefs, altering our behavior, and consciously deciding to adopt a more positive and abundant mindset towards money. Ultimately, mastering your personal psychology around money opens up the door to financial freedom. It's not just about accumulating wealth, but also about creating a life that's rich in experience, satisfaction, and happiness. By understanding and reshaping our attitudes towards money, we unlock the potential to live more abundantly. Making informed decisions not only benefits ourselves, but also the people around us. If you want to improve your psychology around money, then I'll send you my best tips for free down in the description below. I'll see you in the next one, friends. Done.